Welcome back, everyone. It's time for our weekly interview segment, Zoom In. We had always intended this portion of the show to provide a clearer picture of what's happening in the world. And today's interview is no different. When we discuss North Korea, I think it's all too easy for us to assume that the reclusive state would be far behind in technological advancements and, by extension, hacking. But this couldn't be actually further from the truth. If you've heard of the Lazarus Group, or its other names, Zinc or APT38, you'd know that a group of notorious North Korean hackers are credited to breaking into banks, movie companies, and even hospitals, all of which Pyongyang denies. I'm joined via Zoom by author and investigative journalist by the name of Jeff White. He has rigorously looked into the Lazarus Group's multiple hacks. We'll be discussing his recently released book, Inspired by Smash It BBC podcast, The Lazarus Height. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. Hi, Lena. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, now that I've provided all the basic information for our listeners, I do want to provide an explanation. Uh, you've also been investigating cyber crimes for more than a decade from what I understand, but this group of North Korean hackers, in your own words, are considered legendary in the field. Uh, what makes them especially notorious and how did you first discover them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, what makes the Lazarus Group, the, the suspected North Korean government hacking group, um, so famous in the information security world is partly the range of targets they've been after. I mean, you've mentioned in the intro there, they targeted some movie studios and banks and television companies and so on. Um, the full range of the Lazarus Group's hacks, or at least the hacks that have been attributed to them, is absolutely astonishing. I mean, in 2014, they were accused of breaking into Sony Pictures Entertainment and effectively bringing that company to its knees, digitally speaking, you know, turning off thousands of computers, leaking swathes of really, really damaging information now for some hacking groups that would be you know the big job that would be that would be where they'd stop and, and hang up their heels and hang up their boots as it were but for the Lazarus group they went on they went on to attack national banks including the bank of bangladesh the central bank of that country attempting to steal a billion dollars uh, and they then unleashed in 2017 uh, the WannaCry ransomware attack which went around the world disabled computers around the world and as you say disabled some computers within uh, britain's national health service bringing some accident and emergency departments uh, to a halt and they haven't stopped there their latest trick is apparently to target cryptocurrency infrastructure so bitcoin companies and the like and to steal it's estimated upwards of two billion dollars so part of what makes the lazarus group so legendary is the range of targets they go after but also um they tend to leave quite a lot of traces um a lot of computer hacking groups break in and then they cover their tracks quite effectively because they don't want to get caught, they don't want to get found out. The Lazarus Group are an interesting bunch because the way they break in is technically quite adept and certainly the way they manipulate their access once they've got into a company is quite adept. But but once they've got in, they sometimes don't tend to delete their tracks, delete their traces. They leave a lot of evidence lying around for investigators. And that means investigators uh, can often piece together those clues and point a finger at the Lazarus Group. So we know more perhaps about the Lazarus Group's activities than we do about a lot of other computer hacking groups uh, activities. So it's almost as if there are these cookie crumbs for you to lead and to follow. And that's really ironic for me because the idea of the spy agencies or hackers would be to be kept secret. So they wouldn't want to be discovered. And so I guess I'm left wondering, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, do they do that on purpose or are they just not covering up their tracks well? It's a very good question. Part of the answer, I suspect, is that um, if you are hacking from inside North Korea, um, it's a fair bet that you won't ever face justice. You won't be brought to trial for any of these crimes. So the idea of being sent to prison for what you've done is, is very remote uh, for North Korea's hackers. Uh, and so they don't feel the pressure to sort of hide themselves and hide their tracks that other hackers do. The other possible explanation um, is that one thing North Korea is very keen on doing is asserting itself on the world stage and, and increasing its profile on the world stage. And so by committing these crimes and then leaving the traces, it's almost like a sort of calling card that North Korea can leave to say, well, we did these things and you should be scared of us. And in fairness, a lot of security companies are very concerned about the Lazarus Group. So in that respect, I suppose they've, they've achieved their mission if that was what they were trying to do. It's almost as if they want to show off the prowess that they have and they yeah. want to be discovered. It's ironic because I don't believe Pyongyang has accepted responsibility for any of the Lazarus Group's hackings, right? That's right. Yeah. For, for North Korea's part, they say these have nothing to do with these hacking campaigns uh, and that these are a smear campaign by its enemies, notably the US, to denigrate the country and to bring it down. It has to be said, the United States government has put out a considerable amount 
of what it says is evidence against Lazarus Group, hundreds and hundreds of pages now of legal documents, and the United Nations panel of experts that, of course, keeps an eye on North Korea and detects whether it's breaching sanctions and so on, has also looked into these cyber attacks and accumulated a great deal of what it says is evidence against North Korea. So, yes, North Korea is denying it, but there is, there is a growing body of evidence that's, that's weighing in the other direction. You know, Jeff, I was going to ask why of all these uh, cybercrime units did Lazarus get your attention, but it's almost as if it's hard to ignore <laughs> their presence in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, you alluded to some of these high profile cases, and I do want to ask, just in case our listeners are not all caught up, um, how many, um, and I, I suppose the most notable ones that we want to talk about, how many of these Lazarus group uh, linked cybercrimes have you come across? Um well, simply the ones that are reported and the ones that come to our attention, you know, you're talking dozens. And there's an interesting escalation of tactics. I mean, the Lazarus Group started out, like a lot of computer hackers actually do, starting out with um, defacement attacks. They would break into websites and change the front page so it had some some message on the front supporting Lazarus Group's activities. They would do what, what are called denial of service attacks, where you flood a website with traffic and the website goes down and, and, and can't operate. These are low level attacks, they're irritating, but they, you know, the, some hackers wouldn't even class them as hacking. They're, they're more digital sit-ins than, uh, than computer hacking. But then you start to see this escalation in tactics and particularly the um, 2013 attacks on, on, on South Korea, as a lot of your listeners will be familiar with, the so-called dark soul attacks, which hit banks and television stations uh, in South Korea. That really showed an escalation, a big escalation uh, in tactics. Suddenly you start seeing destructive cyber attacks. You start seeing computers and computer networks taken offline, uh, unable to operate, and people unable to get cash from cash points and ATMs uh, in Seoul. It, it, that was a really significant um, upstep uh, in the Lazarus Group's behavior. Uh, as far as hackers are concerned, I would always imagine that they'd have an objective, whether it's political information uh, that will give them a competitive edge or money. So in these hackings that Lazarus Group is allegedly responsible for, what is their goal? It's a really good question. Uh, look, every nation around the world, including South Korea, including the UK, where I am, um, they, they all have computer hacking teams, government computer hacking teams. And certainly in the UK, uh, our computer hackers, government computer hackers have what they call offensive capability, as in they are authorized under some circumstances to break into other governments and other company systems. That's usually about getting strategic advantage. So those government computer hackers are after information that they can use to get one over on their opponents or give themselves an advantage globally. This is the game, it's spying. It's the modern face of spying and that's been going on for as long as there have been uh, governments as far as I'm aware. What's interesting about North Korea is yes, they, they do a lot of that and, and there are campaigns uh, where they're trying, North Korea is trying to break into other uh, governments and company systems to get information and strategic advantage. But what's fascinating is North Korea, because uh, as your listeners will be well aware, because of its difficult financial position, partly caused by North Korea's own militaristic ambitions, um, North Korea is running out of money, is, is desperate for money as far as we know. And so what it's also done is used its government hackers to target financial institutions to steal cash, to take money. That's very, very unusual. Most government's hackers aren't doing that. What that's done is, is exposed to a really interesting set of connections because if you're a computer hacker and you break into a somebody's system, let's say I, you know, I break into your bank account, that's great, I've got access to your bank account, but I need to take your money and I need to somehow move it to somewhere where I control it. If I just transfer your money to Jeff White's bank account at HSBC in the UK, it's gonna be obvious that I stole your money. So what I then need to do is I need to work with money launderers and fraudsters and, and general crooks who can use the money that I've taken from your bank account, hide it, squirrel it away, launder it, and then give it to me. So as North Korea's hackers have, have fought more and more to get access to these financial institutions, they become more and more reliant on international networks of criminals to help them launder and move the money. And that's the really interesting part of the Lazarus Group story for me. And is that also sort of the traces that they leave behind? Um, if there yeah. are other international organizations who are already keeping an eye on these criminals in this case, it would be easier for them to make those links. Yeah, exactly so. Uh, at the point where you're collaborating internationally with street level crooks effectively, those street level crooks are very, very vulnerable to getting arrested and to then exposing what they've been up to on behalf of North Korea, either knowingly or unknowingly. And there's a fascinating story about this. At one stage, the Lazarus Group are accused of breaking into a bank in India called Cosmos Cooperative Bank, um, and then stealing money from that bank and then 
cashing it out in cash points around the world. So effectively, they, they triggered cash points around the world to spew out money, uh, something like $11 million worth of money. Now, what's interesting about that is if it's very clever, isn't it, for a hacker to do that, but you've got to have somebody on the other side of the ATM taking the money and gathering it together and collecting it. Well, that requires accomplices in 29 different countries who can go out onto the street and grab handfuls of cash from the cash points as they spew out that money. Well, then you need to get the money back from those people. So you need to have these international collaborators. And what's interesting is those guys, and it is generally guys who went to the ATMs to pick up the money, they get arrested. And suddenly the police are on the tail of the Lazarus Group and what they've been up to. So you're right, the more, uh, the more ambitious this campaign of getting money around the world becomes, the more um, uh, North Korea's hackers are forced to sort of connect with the real world. And connecting with the real world is risky because that's, that's where the police hang out often. You know, it's interesting because what I was expecting was Lazarus Group to be incredibly high tech, but, but how they retrieve the money sounds incredibly backwards and maybe even archaic. It, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, Lazarus Group, in common with quite a lot of computer hacking groups, some of the stuff is very advanced, you know, that they have computer viruses at their disposal uh, that move frighteningly quickly uh, through a, a, a target victim's network. So they get access to one computer and within a few hours, days, perhaps, they're all over that company's network. And they're very, very, very good at figuring out how companies work. They do a great deal of surveillance on their targets. So once they're in, they don't just grab the money and run. They spend weeks, months, sometimes years looking at that company and, and working out, well, how do they move their money around? Where is their money? How can we get hold of it? So very, very advanced stuff. But you're right, at a certain point, a lot of cybercrime ends up at the street. Uh, and so you need people, as I say, who got runners out in the street who can go and grab that money and take it out of cash points or, or convert it into fast cars or Rolex watches. There's a, there's a sort of heavy end, if you like, a physical end to a lot of cybercrime that often gets uh, gets forgotten. You know, I, I do want to highlight for our listeners that the millennial leader Kim Jong-un has been reportedly pouring in big money in science and tech and advancements of these sectors in North Korea particularly. And of course, the regime claims it's secure. It's too secure, a better future for the country. But the darker underbelly may indicate otherwise the conversation we're having today. Uh, how much has the Lazarus groups then hacking technology evolved over the years? Um, it's interesting. It's definitely kept pace with the state of the art. And one of the really interesting things is is the the current trajectory for security researchers of Lazarus Group. Uh, its current trend is to target these cryptocurrency businesses. So you're talking about Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. Um, what I find remarkable is the kind of stuff that they're using and the kind of companies they're breaking into and the kind of tactics they're using to steal that money and then to launder it, to, to move it around the cryptocurrency world very 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 advanced um you know you're talking about aspects of cryptocurrency that aren't very commonly known frankly i think most of the planet is still trying to get its head around cryptocurrency and catch up with what this means uh, there is a small number of people who really understand understand this stuff and even within that there's a very very small number of people who can control those very new very novel very innovative very high tech bits of the cryptocurrency world. And the idea that North Korea's hackers are there at that very, very cutting edge is absolutely remarkable. So they, 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 their tactics in a way are quite basic. So look, if, if your listeners are after one lesson that they can take away from this, phishing emails is still the way in. Your, your inbox is still the target for hackers. And so look at every email, particularly if it has an attachment attached to it, look at it with suspicion because that's how the hackers get in and Lazarus Group are no exception. But once they're in, once they've used those basic tactics to get in, their ability to understand the victim and understand how the industry works, whether it's cryptocurrency or cash points or international banks or Sony uh, is really, really quite advanced. They're very good at listening and, and understanding the environment that they've broken into. Uh, honestly, uh, we've had so many experts on the show trying to explain blockchain technology, and I, <laughs> say that I, I cannot wrap my head around it. So uh, not only am I kind of blown away that within North Korea that's capable at the highest level, but also the fact that, you know, if, from what I understand, it takes supercomputers and certain circumstances to actually work within Bitcoin or mine Bitcoin or keep track of them or use them even, right? Yes, that's right. At a certain point, you need very, very advanced computing technology to do, as you say, what's called mining, which is creating new cryptocurrency. Um, we're still investigating the extent to which North Korea has been involved with that. I have read some headlines that that's what they're trying to do, but that requires a huge amount of energy. Um, one of the really strange things about cryptocurrency is at a certain point, you're turning energy into money. Um, so you have to pay the electricity bill. 
uh, and you have to get hold of electricity. And so for someone like North Korea that's struggled traditionally with that, with, with keeping the lights on, the idea of then spending a whole bunch of energy and electricity running those supercomputers to create cryptocurrency. I'm not sure how much they do of that, particularly when, as we've seen in the last couple of years, they can break into cryptocurrency companies, allegedly, and steal the money. That's going to be a lot easier than doing the mining work to, 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 to get it set up. But uh, so, yeah, so the the, the, the tactics are quite advanced, the, the knowledge is quite advanced, but the actual, I don't think that they're using supercomputers to do the actual hacking. All right. Thanks for clarifying. Um, you alluded to what happened with Sony Pictures Entertainment a few years back, I believe, when the film The Interview was released or right prior to it, I believe. And I want to mm. revisit it because I, I don't completely understand what exactly happened. Um, what were they after? Because it doesn't seem mm. like it was money. Yes. Yeah, it was a really interesting attack. And I was, I was working at the time for Channel 4 News, UK, UK broadcaster. Um, and I watched, like a lot of other journalists, I watched Barack Obama, who was then obviously US president, blame publicly North Korea for that hack. And I was as sceptical as a lot of other people, because at that point, there was scant information, very, very little information about what had happened at Sony Pictures Entertainment. Um, but what we do know is that middle of 2014, Sony announced that it was going to make, be releasing this, in, this, this movie, The Interview. And the plot of that is a couple of bumbling journalists who end up in North Korea, uh, inadvertently joining a CIA assassination attempt on Kim Jong-un. And the assassination is depicted uh, in the film in quite graphic detail. It is, I think I'm right in saying, one of the, it's possibly the only, if not one of the very, very, very few films that depicts a sitting real world leader being killed on screen in a drama. Uh, that's, that's very rare. And it was a big decision for Sony. North Korea obviously did not like this at all. I wrote to the United Nations complaining about the film wrote to Sony we think complaining about the film as well and saying this is this is uh, you know an act of terror I think they described it as I mean it's it's very difficult to overstate the 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 esteem which I'm sure your listeners will know the esteem with which the Kim regime is Kim dynasty is, is held in North Korea showing that person dying on screen is a big thing um, what we also know now is that North Korea's hackers allegedly targeted Sony very quickly after the, and the film was announced, trying to get access to Sony. And they tried loads of different ways. They tried all the phishing emails, but they also tried breaking in using social media. So they started sending Facebook messages to the cast and crew of this, this film, the interview, to try and get them to click on a link and download some dodgy uh, material. So there's lots of different ways to break into Sony. When they eventually got in, it was a two-stage attack. The first stage was turning off the computers. And they, there were thousands, I think 8,000 computers within Sony were, were just disabled. And they couldn't even send faxes. The employees were reliant on paper and pen. Um, I, I heard that the, the payroll, the, the ability to pay people's paychecks disintegrated because the computers were, were offline. And so there was somebody in the, in the car park at Sony, the parking lot, writing out checks for people's salaries and giving them the checks. It, it just brought the company to its knees for, 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 for weeks, if not months. But then the second stage of the attack is really interesting because they broken into Sony and stolen the emails from inside Sony, the entire email spool, the entire email stash from Sony. And they started leaking it, but they didn't just put the emails out there and say, okay, there's the emails, have a read through them. They broke them into chunks and they started contacting journalists directly to say, would you like to cover this story in this in this leak of emails? That they they almost parceled up the data and they made each release of data more and more significant and more and more impactful. What they did was exactly the way I, as a journalist, uh, would work. You know, you know, if you get a leak of information, you don't just dump it all at once. You, you eke it out, Lena, as I'm sure you're aware. You know, you, you you get the bang for your buck. And so that's what they did. It was it was a, a PR campaign against Sony, and it led ultimately to Amy Pascal, who's the co-chairperson of Sony, uh, losing her job. So it, it does seem like, dep depending on what their agenda may be, they're not necessarily just after money. They're also after to make a statement that, you know, this was, you know, something that North Korea would not be OK with, a smear mm. campaign against a regime that is very particular about keeping up a certain image, to say the least. That might even be an yeah. understatement, because I feel like saying something negatively about its own leaders, that would be subject to criminal charges within North Korea. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say the, the Sony Pictures Entertainment um, attack, I think, is the high tide mark so far for that kind of attack. We haven't seen subsequently North Korea do those reputational attacks. But on the other hand, as I say, n nobody has, has dared since make a film having a go at Kim Jong Un. So perhaps they've they've achieved their target. But their, their subsequent activity has been largely based around getting getting hold of money, getting hold of car hard currency. 
I agree completely with your uh, co-host for your BBC podcast, the Lazarus Heist, um, when she said something along the lines of why didn't Sony just, you know, create a fake country and create yeah. fictional characters <laughs> as opposed to going after, as you've said, a, a sitting leader of a country. It, yeah. it does puzzle me a great deal. Maybe they were trying something new there. Uh, however, it, it did backfire to a certain extent. As far as the movie's concerned, the reviews are split. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. As you say, my co-host for the podcast, Gene Lee, didn't like it. I, I thought it was okay. I, I quite enjoyed it. I wanted to, the film, the film made, um, uh, the film made $15 million, I think, on its opening weekend, which obviously isn't great, but ironically is exactly the same amount of money that Sony said they spent on sorting out the hack was $50 million. So they, the, the film at least achieved its mission of, of paying Sony back for the, for repairing the damage that the, that the film caused them. Jeff, the last question I want to ask you is, of course, uh, why is the Lazarus Group engaging in these hacking activities and where does this really take us next? Because as you implied, governments have been hacking each other and these intelligence mm. agencies have been trying to acquire certain classified information for as long as governments have existed. Yeah. So where does this take us knowing that the Lazarus Group exists? The, the, really, the really important lesson, I think, from the Lazarus Group's perspective um, is twofold. Firstly, they are working with and through and behind organized cybercrime and to a certain extent organized street level crime uh, with the people who are, I say, going to the, the ATMs and the cash points and taking the money. What's interesting about that is that is the direction of travel for a lot of government hacking groups. What they've realized is if you get caught and you get rumbled, there are going to be consequences for you. But if you can hide behind an organized cybercrime group or you can use their tools or you can use their infrastructure or their tactics, it's going to be harder for other governments to call you out. So you detect a hack, you know it's significant, you think it's another government, but because it looks like an organized cybercrime attack, it's really hard to attribute it. So that the direction of travel for North Korea, the, the furrow that they're plowing, if you like, is something that I think other governments are going to start doing. And when those two uh, entities come together, government hackers and organized cybercrime, it's dangerous because government hackers have the time, they, they've got it or infinite government budget, basically all the government budget that they want. They've got the people, they've got the skills, they've got the patience. Organized cybercrime has the networks and the distribution. They've got the coverage. So I, I like to call it the organized cybercrime model. I like to call the Superman three model. Superman three being the film that's released many, many years ago. In that film, one of the villains discovers that the bank is writing off the fractions of a cent at the end of every transaction, they're just writing those off and losing them. So he creates a computer program that hoovers up all of the tiny fractions of a cent into one account and makes millions. So that's the organized cybercrime model. Hit as many people as you can for a low amount. So organized cybercrime will happily steal $5 from you, Lena, because they're doing that to a million people and that's $5 million. That's the organized cybercrime model. If you put that together with the stealthy, patient and well-resourced government hackers, and you put that together with the organized cybercrime, hit them and hope, spray and pray, high volume, low margin. Put those two things together, that's a, that's a sort of dangerous trend. And I think that's what we need to sort of look at in the North Korean example is government hackers working together with organized cybercrime and the danger of that combination. And honestly, my anxiety level has never been higher. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies about that, Lena. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for our conversation. Uh, you've clarified a lot of questions I've had and it was a pleasure as always. And congratulations on the publication of your new book. Thank you. Yeah, Lazarus Heist book is out uh, June 9th uh, and it's available with well, the physical copies in the UK, but the ebook and the audio book, which I narrate, just so that you know, uh, is out on June 9th. That's internationally, so your, your listeners can get a hold of a copy uh, even in South Korea. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.